This grid is the neighborhood of our sham player. It's famous for these chamfered octagonal city blocks. And this is the windy streets of Barry Gothic or the Gothic Quarter in stark contrast to this beautiful systematic grid. This contrast tells the story of Barcelona's history as a city. So Barcelona is the capital of Catalonia, which is a stretch of sunny coastline and epic mountain ranges. Catalonia is well known for its Mediterranean lifestyle, its amazing food, and its massive contributions to arts and culture. It's home to legends like Messi, Dali, Gaudi, Picasso. Barcelona's mix of mountains and oceans draw millions of tourists every year. The city lies between the Bezos and Lobregat rivers to the south and the north. The Mediterranean Sea is on the east, and to the west lies the Serra de Colcerola. This hill right here is called Montjuic, and historians believe that in the Middle Ages this referred to a Jewish cemetery. In medieval times, this hill was the site of a watchtower. In 1641, there was a castle built here, and in the 18th century, it was upgraded to the size it is today. And if we zoom out from Munjuic, you're probably seeing this big section of Aixample with the famous grid and these diagonal lines, and I promise we're gonna get to those. But first, we need to look at the Gothic Quarter, because this is where the city began. 2,000 years ago, before the city of Barcelona, there was a Roman city called Barcino. It followed the classic Roman grid design and was surrounded by walls. Plaza San Jaume is kind of where the original Roman Forum was. Today, if you go to the square, you'll find the city hall and Palau de la Generalitat, which is the seat of Catalonia's government. Plaza Nova is kind of where the westernmost tip of the city was. If you go there today, you can see four remaining towers of the wall that date back to the fourth century. And throughout this part of the city, there are Roman ruins everywhere, just waiting for you to find them. So these streets, kind of where the medieval city ends and the grid begins, is where the old medieval walls of the Gothic Quarter used to run. This section was first built in the 13th century and then they extended it in the 15th century to over here. You can see on this old map next to this middle wall, there's this road that's much thicker than the others. This used to be a stream that ran on the outside of the first wall. In the beginning, it was kind of a sewage runoff area that ran along a stream that came from mountains. But then after they made the second wall, it dried up and it became a main street for the area. Because of how wide the street was, it just naturally became a main road. People started trading and holding events there and eventually started building convents and theaters on this road. In 1776, they demolished this inner wall and then they redeveloped this into a proper main road for the city. They called it La Rambla and they styled it to be similar to a boulevard you might find in Paris. Today, this is one of the busiest, most touristy areas of the city. The walk starting from Plaza de Catalunya going down to the waterfront is one of the classic introductions to Barcelona. Back in the 13th century, there was a little market held on the street that eventually got shifted around and evolved to become what we know today as La Boqueria, which is the starting point for a food tour of Barcelona as well. La Rambla kind of divides the Gothic Quarter into its separate neighborhoods. You've got El Raval to the south and then La Ribera and El Born to the north. So let's talk about the wall and this garden and the castle and how it got there. And to understand that, we have to dive into a little bit of complicated history. Hi, welcome to my balcony. And sparkling water break. Now, when I was researching Barcelona and Catalonia, I don't know if you know, but there's a little bit of controversy around what Catalonia is. I have no idea what that's all about, as I'm not a Spanish man, or a Catalan for that matter. And here at Bright Trip, we mainly concern ourselves with travel, not politics. But politics are important and even more important is understanding the news. And that's why we're super stoked that today's sponsor is Ground News. So Ground News is a website and app developed by a former NASA engineer that is on a mission to give readers an easy, data-driven and objective way of reading the news. Okay, so 
This is the Ground News homepage. Let's take a look at a story that might interest some of us, which is the Boeing situation. So here we can see the top news concerning Boeing. And here we can see already there's an article that is underreported by the left. And let's read this article about the CEO stepping down. So on the right here, you've got the distribution of which news sources are covering it, as well as a breakdown of the specific outlets and their bias. And there's also this cool bias comparison that shows you how different outlets are discussing the topic. And then here you can flip through the tabs yourself to see what type of language is being used where. And then you can actually click through and read a specific article. And all of this is backed by ratings from three different independent news monitoring organizations. Probably one of the most powerful features of Ground News is the blind spot feature, which is this tab where you can go find stories underreported by either the right or the left. And it's a great way to make sure that you're being exposed to viewpoints from all sides of the story. It's pretty cool that Ground News exists in a time like this on the internet. They're not funded by media conglomerates or big tech, and their only mission is to make the news more transparent and trustworthy, which obviously is something that we fully support here at Brightrip. If you subscribe right now with our link in the description, you'll get 40% off their Vantage plan, which gives you access to all of their amazing features. So try it out today for only $5 a month at ground.news forward slash bright trip. And let's get back to Barcelona. This is Spain in 1653. Well, it's not Spain. It's a map of the different kingdoms that would soon become Spain. Back then, this was the Principality of Catalonia. This was the Crown of Aragon. And this was Castile. Over the course of centuries and a series of royal marriages, all of these territories kind of got smushed together into one big thing known as the Monarchy of Spain. But each of these used to be separate places with their own cultural identities and languages. In the year 1700, Charles II, the then ruler of Spain, died without an heir. This left a power vacuum and started the War of Spanish Succession, which was the French Bourbons and the Austrian Habsburgs, who both had princes that were sons of Spanish princesses. So they all had equal claim to the throne. During this war, Catalonia sided with the Austrian Habsburgs and the war went on for 13 years. And throughout the war, Barcelona was invaded and besieged and it actually was bombarded from its own castle twice. In 1714, a 13-month siege by the French against the city ended and Barcelona fell to the Bourbon army. So now there's a new king, Philip V, and he was kind of being bossed around by Louis XIV of France. Louis XIV instructed him to clamp down on the Catalans because they were seen as this rebellious people. So what Philip did is he upgraded Castle Montjuic, he strengthened the walls of the city, and he built a citadel right here, which at the time was the biggest fortress in Europe. They actually demolished half of the neighborhood of La Ribera to make space for the citadel which displaced thousands of people. The walls were both a physical and a legal chokehold on the city. Most of the land around the wall was declared firing range, which means construction was prohibited. And so the combination of these three military institutions and the harsh laws against Barcelona kept the city confined for two centuries. So this little triangle area here is known as Barceloneta. And most of it used to be underwater until the city built Port Vell. In 1447, they built a wall that ran to a little sand island called Mayence. And this created Barcelona's first proper port, even though it was a trading hub in the Mediterranean for centuries. Before this, ships had to send little rowboats out to go do their business on the beach. And so to the north of this wall, over the years, sand started building up and this created the foundation that Barceloneta was built upon. And this neighborhood was actually built to house the people that were displaced during the building of the citadel. By the time the Industrial Revolution rolled around, things started getting really cramped. The textile industry had started to boom in Barcelona. You can see in this old picture, all the smokestacks popping up all around the city. 
and the industry had to compete with the residents for space because they could only build inside of the walls. Eventually, the city had double the population density of Paris, which was a massive problem. It created loads of issues of hygiene, epidemics and disease. The city council had to answer to the central government in Madrid, which saw Barcelona as a military presence in the area, and they didn't want to let go of the fortified walls. But this situation is also kind of what paved the way for Achample to happen because artificially for 200 years all of this land around Barigothic was kept undeveloped which is so unheard of for a city as old as Barcelona. After years of public outcry and protest Madrid finally gave in and allowed Barcelona to tear down its walls. And now that the walls were demolished you had all this open space where you could implement a modern, rational, and hopefully future-proof city plan. So now the year is 1859 and the city of Barcelona runs a competition for urban development programs to figure out what they were going to do with all this space. This competition was initially won by Antoni Rubira y Trias. And it looked very different to the Eichample we see today. The streets were aligned with the shape of the Gothic Quarter and it had a more traditional idea where the rich people lived on the outskirts of the city. But before that could be implemented, the central government in Madrid swooped in and imposed a project designed by an urbanist called Ildefonso Cerda. Sardar was considered to be ahead of his time. At the time, he had already completed a detailed topographic plan of Barcelona, as well as a demographic survey. So he had a great base to design a city plan off of. And this plan looked like this. This is the picture that we all know of Barcelona today. The obvious and most iconic aspect of the plan was the strict grid layout for the city. This grid consisted of square city blocks with chamfered corners which created these octagonal intersections. Serda was obsessed with this idea that in order for residents to be healthy, there needed to be enough sunlight and air and green space in the city. He implemented wide streets and height restrictions to make sure that every part of the city was getting enough sunlight. Each of the blocks had interior courtyards that served as communal areas. Areas, and less than 50% of each block was allowed to have buildings on it, the rest being reserved for green space. And there was a handful of different standardized block designs that could be mixed and matched around the city to create these unique corridors for people, air and sunlight to move around. But what we see on this map is not what Serda had initially designed. There was a lot of tension between the central government and the city council and a lot of back and forth they fought a lot of Sedar's proposals and flat out just rejected some of them. And because of that, Eichample took a long time to build. It took 20 years for the first 250 hectares to be finished, with loads of modifications on top of that. The streets were narrowed, the buildings got higher and higher, and eventually these open blocks were kind of closed off to make space for more building and more lots that you could sell to people and develop. And eventually, these green interior courtyards, most of them became parking lots. Serda also proposed three avenues to connect Barigothic with Eichample, but only one of the three ended up getting built, which was Via Laetana. And that took more than 40 years to build because they had to kind of fight people to demolish buildings that were hundreds of years old. So this road only got finished in the 1950s. So enough history, let's actually take a closer look at Eichample to see how it's laid out. Okay, uh, I mean, I did mess up. This is not called Barri Gothic. This is called the Ciutat Vela, which means old city in Catalan. But, uh, you know. So instead of being laid out by the compass, like aligning to north and south, Eichample was designed to run parallel to the ocean and the mountains. And the first things you see are the five main avenues that connect the different parts of the city. 
Grand Via runs parallel to the shore through the heart of Eichample. This one intersects with Pasig de San Juan, which connects Barigothic to the rest of the city. The Avenidas Diagonal and Meridiana intersect the Gran Via diagonally at Plaza de las Glorias Catalanes. And this was originally intended to be the heart of the city according to Serdar's plan, but over the years it ended up being a huge kind of ugly highway intersection. However, the city is currently working to turn this into a huge green space. And this is also where you'll find Torre Glories, which is the famous bullet-shaped skyscraper. Avenida Paralel connects Plaza de España to the seafront. And it's named Paralel because it's unique in the fact that it's the only avenue that runs parallel to the equator. On the left hand side you can find Sant Antoni Market, which is a less touristy option compared to La Boqueria. Then of course there is Sagrada Familia, which has a neighborhood named after it, which is the giant wonder of the world designed by Gaudi. And then there's also Fort Pienc, which is home to La Monumental, which was the last remaining bullfighting arena in Catalonia. As Aixample grew over the years, it started gobbling up all the villages around it. And eventually they got annexed into Barcelona. Basically, these are all these neighborhoods that aren't grid shaped. If you're on holiday, you'll probably go to Crasia to see Park Güell, which is the whimsical complex turned park designed by Gaudi. So that's the bulk of the layout of Barcelona. Next, let's look at a few of the landmarks that have popped up in the city since Aixample has been built, most of which are connected to big events that have happened. The first one was in 1888. Barcelona hosted its first ever Universal Exposition. This event was focused here, the Ciutadella Park. They demolished the old citadel and the avenue leading up to it was decorated with a triumphant arch. All of the fountains and ponds in the park are as a result of this exposition, as well as the Columbus Monument and the Castle of Three Dragons. 40 years later, the city hosted another international exposition, and this time they decided to center it around Montjuic and Plaza de España. Plaza de España originally was a square where they used to do public hangings, but for this exposition, they completely redeveloped it and turned it into what it is today. There were so many buildings constructed, I can't possibly list all of them here. And the city had to expropriate almost 100 hectares of land to make space. The main buildings that you'll notice is everything around Plaza de España, including the Venetian towers, and then Palau Nacional, the Magic Fountain, and the Spanish village. In the same year, they built the Olympic Stadium. Barcelona was bidding to host an anti-fascist version of the Berlin Olympic Games that was gonna happen in 1936. But unfortunately, the Spanish Civil War put a spanner in the works for that plan. Nearing the end of the 20th century, the city decided to double down on tourism. Barcelona, España. In 1986, Barcelona won the bid to host the 1992 Olympics. This provided huge impetus and also money to revamp the city. When the city was building all the infrastructure and doing all of the renovations for the Olympics, they took a very long-term approach. All of this along the beach used to be industrial area, like derelict industrial area. And for the Olympics, they demolished all of it and rebuilt it into this promenade. They created all of these artificial beaches which is what Barcelona is famous for today. And just inland of this beach, they built the Olympic Village, which is today a residential area. And this Olympic Stadium that they built back in 1929 finally got to see its glory day. They turned this whole area into a giant sports complex. Port Vell was completely overhauled. Barceloneta became a beautiful tourist destination. This was an absolutely monumental moment for Barcelona and the 1992 Olympics is seen as one of the most successful Olympics ever. After the Olympics, Barcelona emerged as one of the world's top tourist destinations. And that kind of brings us to today. There's a lot more developments happening at the moment, but hopefully this gives you an overview of the city. Thank you so much for watching. Stay curious.